and going live on Facebook for, we do have quite a lot of people that join on Facebook. They write really nice comments, which is quite sweet actually. Um, there we go. All right, Mark, over to you. It's all happening. It is happening indeed, Cassandra. Uh, we're delighted today to have um, Tiffany Troy, Mitchell Glazier, Kyle Liang, Rebecca Tseng, and Kelly Canada reading with us. Um, but before we get to that, uh, let me introduce uh, my co-host, um, Jeffrey Cyphers Wright, who received his MFA for, after studying with Allen Ginsberg. He's best known as a new romantic poet. He's also a publisher, critic, eco-activist, impresario, filmmaker, puppeteer, and artist. He's author of 19 books of poetry, including Blue Liar and Party Everywhere. His poems have appeared in the Cafe Review, New American Writing, the Brooklyn Rail, the Hurricane Review, Posit, and many others. Um, his latest work, a book of sonnets and artwork called Doppelgangster, is from Mad Hat Press. Jeff recently won the Service and James Tate Prize, and he publishes the amazing Live Mag. Welcome, Jeff. And um, thank you, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. It's great to see you all. And uh, I keep thinking of this song, you know, dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. Oh. Look at this, this is, a, this is a mirror view. Anyway, I want to uh, welcome everybody again and uh, thank Mark so much. Mark is the most prolific, amazing guy. He's like a kaleidoscope of whirlwinds doing stuff all the time. He's got his hand everywhere. He's helping us all so much because he published my book, you know, <laughs> Doppelgangster. So I'd like to read the title poem. This is a card that uh, Joel Daly from Fell Swoop out of New Orleans published. The title poem, Doppel Gangster. Wolf behind the wheel, what dudes we be, skimming masks of glass across a bourbon sea, the mirror smoking all my weed, terminal desire in the oracle flare, selling fiddles to infidels under withering fire, silent heat rings, Jade from me, these lines raked like coals from the sun. Uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, I will now proceed to introduce our lovely host, this uh, with the Molsus, Cassandra. Always such a witty word to say after everybody's wonderful stuff. Cassandra is an award winning. Poet Cassandra Atherton is an award-winning prose poet and international expert on prose poetry. Her prose, prose poetry is widely anthologized and has been translated into Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. Cassandra has published more than 30 books and is currently writing an illustrated book of prose poetry on the Hiroshima Maidens with funding from the Australia Council and the Victorian government. Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry, an introduction and co-edited the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. You can see some of these books on her great website. She's commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Cassandra, take it over. Ah, thank you, lovely poet. Um, yes, so I'm also doing a book on ekphrastic poetry um, for Princeton. So if people have ekphrastic poems, please feel three, free to send them through. And if they fit into a chapter and argument, um, I will approach you to be able to use them. So that's my exciting project for next year. But I'm going to read a poem called Without a Trace today. And um, it is a prose poem because I only write prose poems. I trace you with tracing paper. I trace your lines and your curves. I trace your thoughts and desires. So I end up tracing myself. Like Renee Magritte's The Rape. I try to trace the essence of you, your voice box telling me it is impossible as I try to trace your Adam's apple. I hold it down and slip my pencil around it. Kubla Khan's Pleasure Dome. My pencil perforates the paper. Your fingers slip down to my hips as you encourage me to lie on top of you. 
The tracing paper crinkles. It is a thin barrier between us, but I can see you beneath it. I can just make out your shape, outline, my pencil thin, unbroken. Like a crime scene, you are my victim. You lay down for me. I think of us on either side of the paper. You pressed up against the shiny side, me on the matte side. Our imprints on either side of the paper, waiting to merge. But we are two different sides of the same paper. I am your inverse shadow, your opposite. I line up our noses, but then my legs are much shorter than yours. If I line up our toes, then my head will rest on the silky paper of your chest. So I line up our hips and rock you awake so that I can trace every inch of your desire for me to keep a record. Scribe, cuckold me, you tell me, but we are way past that. You roll us over so that I am beneath you. The paper crinkles again like Boxing Day rubbish, and I feel my rib cage like a gilded cage for my heart. I am constricted, boa constrictor, accordion, flattened, doughy thighs cushioning my blue shins. I trace you with tracing paper. I trace you for the time when you are gone, your shape, your fingers, the slight curve of your hip. I trace all your lines and curves. I trace your thoughts and desires. So I end up tracing myself and I see that all I have done is blunted my pencil. Next we have... As Jeff said, the most amazing Mark Vincennes, who is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist and musician. He's published over 30 books of poetry, translations and fiction, including more recently, 39 Wonders and Other Management Issues, The Pearl Diver of Irunmani with White Pine Press, A Splash of Cave Paint with Spite and Dival, and a chapbook, An Alphabet of Last Rites with Chavina Barber. The King of Prussia is Drunk on Stars is forthcoming in January 2024 from Lavender Inc. And later that year, The Visitation, a novelette, is coming out with Sir Vision. Mark is also a prolific translator and has translated from the regulars, know this one, German, Romanian, and French. He's published 11 books of translations, most recently an Audible Blue selected poems 1963 to 2016 by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz, which won the 2023 Massachusetts Book Prize for Translated Literature. So it's an award-winning poet and an award-winning translator. His own work has been translated into many languages, including Japanese, Chinese, Russian, French, Italian, Romanian, Greek, German, and Icelandic. He is currently working on a novel entitled The Age of Occasions. Vincennes is editor and publisher of Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. And he is our favorite bit, everyone. He's lived all over the world from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but he now lives on Fire Fire Farm in rural Western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain, Melville's inspiration for Moby Dick, where there are more, okay, this is for me the last one of the year, where there are more sawflies, signate melon, oh, Milano loafy. Oh, it can't be that. Melan- Melanolophy and two spotted tree crickets that Homo sapiens. Tell me about the melancholy melanophy, Mark. <laughs> well, they're a kind of moth, but they only have a Latin name for souls. Oh, and they're sad if they've got melon in them. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, this poem is called In the Dark Corner of a Field Again. Is choice a consistency? He who wanders through the grass, Confucius said, open up, opens up the ends of the earth. The apple tree blossoms are luminous. As the green seas pale as silver, they sleep deep in the vault. And when they emerge, they recognize no one. The signs in our hearts are the paths to our treadways, the crisscross rivers of fragrance and pheromones. Half muffled, a bark. Is there a guiding spirit? Who beats? the quilts in silky beds of reed, or like that choice consistency in bread, where the old moon sacrifices almighty God, where in the green vault they're shaking out their linens, or is this a sanctuary that never arises? They were let out before they started. They stared into the corner of the field, intense, intensely held in sway to much cement pouring from their hearts so long to home, but no, it doesn't end here. And now in the pepper trees, in the reflections of the dark waters, and don't forget 
inside the glass, translucent with frost that never opens, jars, sketches, encourages faces, a mild wisdom to take away. I wish I might quietly ask how those towers were built, why they're growling at everything, and how those shadows with their raspy cores and snow-powdered throats can still get through and come home. A very weird one, huh? Weird. <laughs> um, I'm now delighted to present the first of our readers today, who is Kyle Yang. Um, and Kyle is the son of a Taiwanese and, Malay and Mal Malaysian immigrants. He is the author of the chapbook, How to Build a House, from Swanside Press, and his debut full-length collection, Good Son, forthcoming from Sundress Publications. Um, I guess it already came out in March 20, oh no, tw March 2024, next year. His work has appeared in the best of the net, Asian American Writers Workshops, The Margins, uh, Glass, A Journal of Poetry, Wildness, Diode, and elsewhere. In addition to working as a physician assistant at New York Presbyterian Whale Cornell, Carl teaches at Quinnipiac University and Brooklyn Poets. He lives with his wife, Morgan, in New York City. Welcome, Kyle. Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. And excited to be reading here tonight. Um, thank you for the invitation to read. It's, it's, it's nice to be joined by some, some fellow poets. Um, so uh, try not to talk too much. I'm just going to dive right into the poems. Um, one of the things that's exciting about having a book is that I feel like I have a publisher who really trusts me um, and really believes in my work and wants to publish the poems that I feel like, you know, I want to be writing and that not everyone may be interested in. And so I'm really excited for, for some of these poems to be coming out. And so I'll, for the most part, be reading poems tonight that are from my full length. Um, that's coming out in the spring that uh, hasn't really appeared anywhere else. And uh, just want to give a big shout out to my publisher for that and for entrusting me with and believing me in, in my poetry. So this uh, first poem is titled Property Line. No one told me I couldn't lay here. So here I am laid across this border waiting for the sea to take my body from the shore or for the police to take turns gnawing my flesh like flies, telling me which parts I can keep and which are illegal. No one gave me permission, but no one said there needed to be permission granted either. I can lay like this for years. I can live in the shelter of the birds overhead until you finally decide what to call this. Barely living, half alive, the salt water pulling at my wet legs as if to drag me. The sand under my torso, carved out like a coffin, weakly anchoring me to land. A white man walking the beach with his daughter stop when they see my blistering body, limbs laid how I last left them. They decide to help. So they rush home and bring back a homemade sign that says, for sale. They drive it into the sand beside my head and proudly wait. The father looks down at his daughter and smiles. She thinks to herself, perhaps I should do a good deed for someone every day. Perhaps I should become a senator. What better way to perform random acts of kindness than with more lies? Her mother, his wife arrives and feeds me water from the ocean, scooping it into my mouth with her empty glass wine bottle. She makes me hypertonic. She makes me demyelinate. Water retreats from my brain to correct the concentration. My parenchyma shrinks. I retreat from my body and leave them with what they were looking for when they found me in the first place. 
Um, so I obviously work in healthcare um, and uh, obviously Asian American. Um, you know, my mother came to this country and documented my father's from Taiwan. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about borders, um, about what rights we should be entitled to as people and working in healthcare, I, in especially in New York City, you know, I see big uh, health disparities, unfortunately. And um, it's something that I haven't even started exploring in my writing until very recently. So um, I'll be reading this next one will be another prose poem um, uh, written more recently. It's, it's, it's from my book. It's titled Non Maleficence. I told the doctor my brother and I are hungry. So he told us to eat our feet. But sir, I said, if we eat our feet, then how will we walk home? He told us to make a boat with our bodies and sail home. You can go back to where you came from, he said. You can leave your mother's uterus in your place. Consider it a trade, two bodies for creation. My mother, not knowing what she was agreeing to, agreed. But mama, he's going to take your uterus. What's my uterus, she asked. I cried into her dress. I told the doctor my mother can't provide informed consent. What's informed consent, he asked. I cried again. A nurse took my brother and I by the hand and walked us down a hallway. We asked her where we were going. We asked where she was taking us. Shh. It spread through droplets, the nurse said sweetly, and placed duct tape over our mouths. The hallway lights became less yellow and more white while the, the further we walked. Soon we were standing in a laboratory with four men in hazmat suits. By the time we noticed there was no one holding our hands, the nurse was gone. We've got two Kung Flus, one said in a muffled voice, presumably into a walkie-talkie or radio. We'll start with the smaller of the two. I thrashed as they grabbed me by the armpits and I looked back at my brother who they began spraying with a hose. I cried into the sterile sleeve of one of the hazmat suits as my shoes skidded across the floor. My stomach rumbled and I thought of my mother's dress. Um, that one was inspired by, unfortunately, an incident where my mom saw a gynecologist and um, the gynecologist offered to help her with her incontinence, and um, which is not uncommon for women after, you know, giving birth. And um, my brother told me, he was like, hey, did you know that mom's gynecologist uh, scheduled her for a hysterectomy? And um, my mom didn't even know what hysterectomy was. All she was told is that it would treat her, her incontinence. And so, um, again, just, just, just some of the barriers to, to, to wellness in, in our country. Um, I guess kind of going along the same theme, um, this uh, next two poems, uh, also kind of relate to healthcare. Again, something I'm exploring, something I'm still discovering and um, learning more about in my writing. Uh, this next poem is titled Nomenclature. We give what we can afford. We afford what we can. We can tear a cow to shreds and call it steak tips, place a napkin on our laps and say it's fine dining. A dog is a dog but his sister is a, humans are patients when their bodies become answerless. Death is given a time pronounced as if there is a right and wrong way to speak of parting. I call their families after speaking in silences. I call with a plan of how many times to utter, I'm sorry, before they think I did it. My parents take turns trying to describe how I look different when I return for Thanksgiving. Atrophied, masked faces, 
symptomatic. In medicine, we call the things we don't understand idiopathic. The problems we cause iatrogenic. We're expected to have a name and answer for everything. Do you know what happens to banana trees who grow the most? Their hands are cut off when everyone's hungry. Okay. Um, I am kind of a, I'm a big fan. I'm just gonna read one more poem. I'm a big fan of um, the, I, I love, collections that have like a really strong theme from start to finish but I also really appreciate poetry collections from like you know like less recent uh that are kind of just from like a segment of someone's life like you know like collected poems from like 1974 to like 1979 I think that's really cool um it's it's just it, you kind of get like a slice of that person's uh, life and and I feel like my collection is kind of like that it's 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 really kind of just like a slice of my life um, and so I realized when I was putting together this collection I was like wow <laughs> it feels very hopeless especially with some of the the, the themes about healthcare and health disparities um, and I thought about what gives me hope in my life and um, a lot of that comes from from love and romantic love in my wife and 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 feeling like there is is reason and purpose through that and so uh, the last section of this of this book is is really dedicated to I mean the whole book is but the particular this last section is uh, really romantic love poems uh, dedicated to my wife because of how she reminds me of of, of why uh, we're here why I need to be here why we all need to be here. Um, so uh, this last poem is, is titled Birds. Birds. Ask me whose fists I father, my love. Ask how the violence of the birds I shot and killed as a boy still haunt me. And how long it's been since I last ate one. Dogs pass me waiting for which of us will bark first. Our jowls stirring with impatience. I pray for parts that make me human enough. I accept the thunder and rain. How the sun on the wet cement after a storm recovers smells and leaves us with a taste we can almost name. I am grateful for all that happened because all that happened brought me you. Thank you. Oh, that was really terrific, Kyle. Thank you so much. Wow. You know, everybody should be hungry if anybody's hungry. Um, wonderful stuff. Great blending of classics and uh, philosophy and religion. So much spirit there. Wow, man. <laughs> Congrats. And uh, next up, we have Kelly Can I'm sorry, Canaday. Kelly Canaday's work appears in the Blue Mountain Review, Tupelo Quarter, NPR WGCU, and Into the Void, among others. She has an MFA from Columbia University and teaches creative writing in Florida. Her first chat book, The House of Women, is upcoming with Dancing Girl Press. Sounds really good. And um, Kelly, can you say, did I say it right? Sorry. Um, no worries. Everyone gets it wrong. Um, Canada. OK. All right. Kelly Canada. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, it's amazing to be here. Um, super tough acts to follow. So I'm actually not going to read from the chat book because I'm kind of tired of reading those over and over at this point. So here's a few from um, Tupelo Quarterly. Um, and just a random shout out to Jim Morrison, who recently had a birthday. So I don't know, just something I'm channeling, I guess. Um, 
So this first one is called Sunday at the Hospital Garden. After an apocalypse, I feed the ducks and pray. The songs I thought the world had wanted so generously, a barking that lifted the bird's head humanly. I was bones, next flesh on the garden wall. Flesh on the news, flesh that wakes to cold coffee and applesauce. A freezing year or a thawing year, a beetle in your hair. We eat meat and get over it. We cross streets of water and get over it. I'm sorry we couldn't save each other. What can feel like war? What can feel like another? A big pier on top of a dancing, drowning world in which we are so rarely who we are. A mother gesturing to an infant tumbling into ocean. Having passed the test of drunkenness, I come to say to a sinking man, see the sirens opposite one's being, the small voice telling of endings. I'm wishing I could afford to be restless. Instead, I carry on in a hollowed imagination, thinking past the part of us that can't help but keep our backs lined up to the earth at some face. Alive and divided, back to life in these hospitals and emergency rooms. My feet disappear into pools of gasoline. My first dog howls in my mind, how my brain once fired and may fire again, behind the blush and the unbrushed hair, the city toppling. The shadows of jumping lizards remind me to wait for heaven, that it might hold me like a grinning cat. It might be as heavy as a pair of iron slacks creased before the open ground. I might learn who I am, free from worship and fear. Um, this next one is called Pastor Mark Benedict, who um, was an Uber driver that I had one time, and we had a deep chat and so I wrote this poem about him. <clears throat> My first thought when I woke up from surgery was I'm a better person when I'm an alcoholic. With the soul of a golden casino, I'd witnessed my love for humanity at the slot machine. The streets of my hometown try too hard. The way one counts time when they're happy and do not know it. I hate them all. I love them all. He tells me our history is hardly beginning to see peace as automatic. It's hard for a violent person. The relief of work, the restriction of a window. The voice of the teacher in your mind is ready for the palm of day, clean as citrine. I think of the old drive home. I trace this cathedral. My vanity project is crumbling. It is hard to keep score. Um, and this last one I wrote um, during COVID and I revised during my MFA. Um, cumulative. I'm tired of the people on the internet who call themselves empaths and everyone else a narcissist. I'm above no one, not even my past. 8 a.m. There's no puzzle to solve, no real life. I bury my phone and go on a walk. There's an ad for a matchmaker and a sign on someone's lawn that says there's nothing inside worth dying for. The whole country's on lockdown and I'm above no one. The world is yours. I walk laps around my swimming pool, wanting to fall in again how I did after coming off the middle school bus. The teacher read us Treasure Island when pain was only the curiosity of my legs falling asleep. Can I start over? I had a love, but I lived underwater, pretending to be beautiful and dumb. We didn't mind. It's a question of staying alive, and I didn't know, I still knew what it was I was meant for. Old music, old wounds, old vinyl salon chairs, and looking up at my grandmother's new hair. Old horrors and eyeliner flaked into my eyes. Can I start over? The instructor begins the lecture. 
on my weight and the weather. She says I should talk more about my hobbies. When I got into the final round of the chess competition, I knew if I let him win, he still wouldn't look at me. As girls, we're taught to be careful when it comes to who watches through your windows. Now you're told don't bother, put life up to your screen. Arrow your warmth and shutter in place, shadowed and content. It's very content, this half-life. Can I start over? These are my thoughts on time. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Stunning poems. And now just, my, my mouse seems to have run out of battery here. I can't move it. There we go. Well, no. <laughs> Literally, my mouse has run out of juice. There we go. All right. Next, we hear from Tiffany Troy, who is the author of Dominance from Blazebox Books and co translator of Santiago Acosta's The Coming Desert, El Proximo Desierto, forthcoming alliteration publishing, publishing house. In collaboration with Acosta and the 4W International Women Collective Translation Project at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Tiffany is managing editor at Tupelo Quarterly and book review co-editor at the Los Angeles Review. Welcome, Tiffany. Thank you so much for having me and what a pleasure to listen to Kyle and Kelly read. Um, and I can't wait to hear Mitchell and Rebecca read after. I'm gonna read uh, four poems um, pretext is the first poem of Dominus, and it's based on Re Rebecca's recommendation, so thank you, <laughs> Rebecca. Yeah, you told me to put it first. Um, so anyway, pretext. As I made my way out of the double bind maze and called relevance and space out for what they were, it was Saturday. It struck me as I watched the snow fall that we were never entirely forsaken. Marari, Maria Goretti stands straight and knee socks in the code. Miracles fit for a baby tiger. The stargazer lilies stand for our, our wavering faith. And the cutthroat day to day dyes our hair for silver than white. Out my window, I never see the sun but its reflection on the white building between brick tenements. Once upon a time when I saw snow, I prayed for a snow day. Now, snow is mercy to the condemned. I wondered if the snow meant I could trust that the crooked path could be made straight again in our ethnic enclave on the stark parking lot on the concrete inside the barbed wires overlooking the colorful shops. Snow blankets are vision the way parishioners present Maria with sunflowers to honor her faith. I smile, remembering a client's hope for all workers to receive what they deserve before continuing on my way. This next poem is called, Imagine the Sky Without Twilight. Imagine the sky without twilight, no dawn or dusk, just pure darkness, no moon. In that solitude, every bit of your body vibrates and the voice tells you, you are nobody. You are in an egg to be cracked open and your yolk fried golden then consumed. You cracked as mama held you, a nobody. Not Odysseus under sheepskin, his mouth so warm from Circe's breasts, his heart so lingering under the shadow cast under which he once saw Penelope's face clearly. You hold tight to chiseled impression of the clouds, standing free like deities with titanium white mixed with some gray in the baby blue sky. Sometimes, when you are so perturbed by the voice at midnight turning to cast blame, tapping on your shoulder, asking why you haven't done enough, 
You feel your split now hurting your nerves most acutely. Your center breaks and all you wish for is light to shine upon your wide open eyes. As you wait patiently, you feel your heart harden, no longer gooey, but baked. The depths of your soul still golden and complicit because even after they gagged you, you felt for management, which asked, excuse me, but do you believe wrongdoing happened under your watch? This next poem is inspired by a conversation with Heidi Julevitz, um, who hated her last name always being spelled wrong. And we sort of talked about the idea of names and the idea of immigration and belonging. Plus Otra. In the stained glass factory, the glazier pinned the violet upon the crucible with purple and gold set upon the metal frame. She dabs molten glass into the lapis lazuli, not by choice, but necessity, as heat melts the ultramarine, the plus ultra. The sea of the sky beacons, broken by the rising sun. The great granddaughter of the glazier does not remember the waves of the Hudson River, only the echoes of bell pronouncements at Ellis Island reverberating years later as she frames the drone frequenting the low skyline. In the intimacy of disparate parts, the girl whispers into the years of the passerby, fractals of true artistry that went beyond the intensity thought possible in photographs as centuries pass upon the metamorphic bedrock filled with towers of babel made of glass and steel. The lore of fables which once bound rapt audiences are now long forgotten. On the subway, the girl studies photos of sites she beheld, the smell of unwashed bodies and marijuana and refashioned vintage seven trains. She thinks of how she is the last of her tribe. Memories of her lineage hug her legs like cold air when the train door opens, fickle like the red twin tree in her night lamp, or memories of downing defrosted frozen fruits, their sugar already gone. In a lab of molten glass, her fingers burned like Prometheus's fire. Gatsby's junkyard once shone proud with a unisphere, now a swamp for Canada geese and mallard ducks. The girl walks as steam rises to occlude sight with fog the color of mist in the grass. At home, the girl recounts the sun and its octagonal beauty, the life beneath the stillness of the turquoise green pond. Mama laughs before turning down the lights and kissing the girl on her head, wishing her a kaleidoscope of sweet dreams. And this last poem um, is really inspired by Kelly Canadays' poems. Um, so anyway, Tilos. Mama, I don't pick fights with anyone, but if my Tilos as master's disciple is to be a megaphone for others, don't you wonder what happens if when I speak, all I hear are echoes. In high school, Running all the way to chambers, I laughed as I caught the train back home to Papa. I did not know behind his smile was rage, which like Isaiah's was rooted in the wrongness of the world. One day, a man with tanned elbows rolled his knuckle in my waist through my down jacket. I looked at the man across from me to say something. I walked to the other side of the train at Queensboro. Later, when a man pressed my neck against the wall, twisting my arms like rubber, I knew better than to look around for sympathy. I struggled to get loose from his hands. Slowly, I jumped through rocks with scraped knees, learning why the Spartans left their young out. When I learned those eyes went after my dear friend too, 
I felt relief before rage. I learned to play with the coins in my hand. The enemies I slay are not dragons, but scarecrows I burn. For every girl I ever was, every girl who thought maybe she had wronged the world by existing. Thank you so much. Yay, Tiffany Choi, amazing. That was wonderful. Odysseus is clapping for you even. Your fractal matrix fables uh, won't be forgotten. I tell you, that was wonderful, huh? Tiffany Choi, thank you. And uh, next, and I, I need to mention Tiffany, so you can curate this just to remind us of myself here, right? One more time, sorry. Oh, you kind of curated some, most of this one, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so shout I, out. I was really lucky to gather most of my favorite poets in the world <laughs> into the Zoom space. All right. Thank you so much. What a joy for us all. So um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our next reader. Rebecca Penway Tsang, and I have to mention here that I, I know this uh, wonderful painter named Marlene Tsang, T-S-E-N-G, and uh, anyway, so uh, Rebecca is a Taiwanese-American writer. She holds an MFA from Columbia University, and her work can be found or is forthcoming in Asian-American Writers Workshop, Chrysanthemum, Taiwanese Poets Anthology, the Academy of American Poets, Honey Literature, Black Sunflower Poetry Press, and others. Rebecca currently works at Penguin Random House, where she helps get books to classrooms and libraries, and she lives with her two pet bunnies who are madly in love. Yay, Rebecca. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be here reading alongside so many wonderful writers. Congratulations, Tiffany, on the incredible launch of your book. I have my copy on my lap. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's been getting dark so early, so I thought I'd read a few of what I call my shiny poems that I wrote from last winter until this winter. Um, they're kind of like my quote-unquote heart-shaped poems. It's okay. Only once in your life will you have a life-defining kiss. Life is pink, and if you're lucky, love is red. I am lucky because I know how to knit, and because smart people worry about astrophysics on my behalf. To demonstrate spectacular confidence, a comet lands like a brilliant white egg in the sky. Reality is a gesture towards space, waiting to be seen by somebody else. Our eyes may never adjust. Love, move toward me like a boat of animals. I want to hear music in an eternal mirror. At midnight, when the rabbit's foot twitches three times in sleep, you will find your lover in a flower made of fields. Only once in your life will you have a life-defining kiss, but may the others be just as good. If you stay up late talking about desire, you will wake under an open window holding fistfuls of silver thread. And my next one is a prose poem, actually, and it's called Loneliness Lore. It's the first time I, I'm ever reading this, so <laughs> bear with me. Loneliness Lore. At the karaoke bar, my dress hikes over my legs, pink-faced and ruffled, and my heart is swinging into yours. Sometimes things are black and white. You get the job or you don't. She is sick or she isn't. Your dream will come true or won't. Spin the bottle toward a more desirable species. I think I love you like no other. The right song might ensure you fall in love with a stranger, but in the after part, you're riding in your car with a miniature headache. Sequins like embers, the photograph spinning, and moonlight is a ribbon in your glass. This time, I want to get it right. I want to face the right direction and shout at it that I'm happy. When you said to me, I think I like you and nothing else mattered, it's too easy to say something and never move on. I love you, I love you not. Hurt is shared, like a platter of cheese or a blue fountain at the center of our city. Isn't that something? 
I think about you and wish you better luck in the next life. Met you in a dream or I didn't. On the back of my hand, a love note you will never read. And since we have some lovely poets of Taiwanese descent here with us today, I thought I'd read a Taiwan poem. And this is a persona poem called Taipei Movie Star. Taipei Movie Star. If I make an enemy, I still would like them to buy me dinner. Aren't you savvy when you look the rabbit in the eye? If you see tinsel on my lashes, be sure to give me a call. Buy me a cocktail and place a ruby in my dark hair. Mother told me glamour is a universal language. After all, we are floating on the disco ball of sadness. Even in alleys where trees swing low, I am a starlet in disguise. The clue to my affection is in the photograph of a girl. Climb a mountain the right way, you might find me there. Climb the mountain wrong, you might not make it down. This whole city can fit inside a glass jar. Tonight, I'll ride my magic horse in circles of neon light. And... My next one, next to last one, is a bit of a short and silly one about love and failed love. <laughs> My responsibility. Everything about our conversation was dishonest. His greatest fear was fighting a kangaroo or getting his shoe stolen by a malicious dog. We shared a mutual love of croissants and not much else. He was in a band that never went anywhere I didn't want to go to the party, but of course I did. He was impressed by my potential and large document of unfinished language. He gave the feeling of a man with a deeply unhappy father, but I never found out. I pretended to not be a visionary, but knew what hurt him if he hurt me first. I am not proud of this part of my life experience. Look, there's the curtain now, closing on us like a miniature play. And lastly, I'll be reading a poem called It Factor. Um, I love animals in poems. My bunnies make it into my poems a lot. <laughs> so here is one of my animal poems. It Factor. Even animals have the it factor, like the capybara with extra strut or the octopus who wins the heart of a second octopus after months of pining behind a seabed. Earth life is nonsense, and only some of it scientifically sound. A bee falls asleep on my bag with the pink hand-woven flowers. A dormant mouse makes a home out of a paper mache volcano. Seven house goats trek through the woods before returning in time for cherry season. All the animals in need of love and collectively, we may be turning Earth a little faster. Winter is emptying its music in the new year when I cross the invisible bridge, high and mighty, like a star wishing to be wished upon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Who doesn't want to be wished upon? Uh, next, we have from Mitchell Glazier who's a poet from West Virginia. He holds an MFA in poetry from Columbia University where he was a teaching fellow. Uh, Mitchell's poetry has appeared or is forthcoming in River, Styx, Washington Square Review, Annulette, Tupelo Quarterly and elsewhere. Uh, Mitchell reads for American Core Data and lives in New York City where he directs a creative writing program for high school students at Columbia School of the Arts. Welcome Mitchell. Well, thank you so much. So wonderful to be here. Thank you first to Tiffany, without whom I would not be here, uh, and Cassandra and team as well, um, and the wonderful readers. I'm just in awe to be among you and such a gift to share one's work um, in such a su supportive space. I'm sure we all know these spaces are quite rare. Um, so six poems this evening, a few are very short. Um, this first poem, um, within every stanza begins with a question either refracted from or inspired by Jenny Holzer. Uh, anyone loves Jenny's work? Um, Firstborn, 
who do you answer to? A long blonde fire, the gnomic pink cock of that office, my lonesome hero licking a bicycle seat. How often have you cherished the mundane? A tattooed bicep shining in oil and the pink cakes when I was a boy ago. Will you protect yourself from what you want? The roadside beauty smelled of hunted animal fat. I was never well known. Has your achievement required sacrifice? No ornament, no sop, a gray gabled room in West Virginia where it paces. Repetition of mossed feet, nailed in elevator pine. No squirming out except for the thick braid. Is a relaxed man a better man? My cage had a beast's dollhouse and a noose of garland I hung there. A little glass orb in a cornflower mood slept on the littlest wicker chair. Can abstraction be a type of decadence? We gag time over glittery yolks at the sky luncheonette. Have you eaten yourself into your father figure? Notice the sharp eel he casts on the ground, the book still open to where he stopped thrashing. Tell us your oldest fear. What happened to you was an art, but a nip at the waist, a halo enclosing. And the next poem is quite short. Um, the Fates Respond. Pretty hot weather for dead horses. Child, I trusted beauty, my windy anonymous. My loved ones now grow lithe, unable to spank the roasts for as long as they used to, ignoring the family history and suicides. Plain talk of recipes. God, I am not like you. And the next poem um, is currently the title poem of a manuscript in progress, my debut or first world. Um, it blends some true crime John Wayne Gacy stuff, um, of which I'm kind of deeply obsessed aside from poetry, and features Ovaltine, if anyone remembers Ovaltine as a beverage from childhood. <laughs> um, so I'll just hop in now. The last time I saw the boy I left behind me, like the ransom artist homing stolen crib tassels in blue aspic, knocking the xylophone of bones whittled by Ovaltine. The dead boys gossip and coo for their keeper's cannibal apple juice as he bends into the horn-rimmed light flickering at the length, flickering at the end of a waist-length chant. No doll eyes left to steal in the suburban dark. Now at his old age, he shakes for one last ligature into the window peeper's rainbow wig. Too late for school to bury the second self now. All our lies curl in fur yowls under the squiggling fountain pens of next century sex. Let them paint us puckered in high collar against the blush poppy seed. Boy hide dews, triple maggots to the gelatin chest, cinching the artist's sleeping face, beholden to as in after suicide, a ballet alone. And the next poem, I don't think I have many poems that are funny, um, but to me, this one was very fun to write. Um, I don't know, it's kind of also a diss poem for a few poets who are like ultra wealthy and hiding it. And I just thought that would be kind of fun to hide in my manuscript. Um, I don't know, or just, you know, poets who don't deserve the accolades they may have. I don't know, no one, in <laughs> no one here. Um, anyway, this poem is called, oh, it also features two Debbies, um, Debbie Harry and Little Debbie of, of the Snack Cake um, Empire. So that's kind of fun. So, <laughs> uh, Carnal Flower, famous poets, country cottages and little flair or permanence. Still in all, nothing wild about you but cigarettes and magazines, drinking a cocktail in the toilet stall, childless, snorting a curled lemon heel. Debbie Harry once puked so viciously upon the shoe buckle of little Debbie. For one of them, life purely ravaged, a little fugue of upside down cakes. For the other, a life of cigarettes and magazines, 
wet cinnamon moans with liquor armed dales. That's all there is, isn't there? Mirror crotches, eggs greening, your mother's mother's eyes. Still in all, nothing wild about you. Ghost bloom alone in the toilet stall, but cigarettes and magazines, cigarettes and magazines. And I have two poems left. Um, this poem, the ink is still quite wet. Um, it was written this week, um, but I was pretty excited by it. And I always like to throw in some new things uh, for readings that feel a little special and fresh. Um, this poem is called Handsome, and there's also a little Christmas situation happening within, so maybe a little bit on theme uh, for the time of year. Handsome. Never a brassy pageant starlet, I wrapped the fine avocado silk scarf over my face for the length of the Christmas recital. Hours after, bangles jangling, the choir master rang up my mother. If I didn't practice the notes to match the others, I would be let go cold. There was no word for disturbance in those days. Now, so many tinsel abandonments from them, I understand. Surely I'd be let go and die, a buckshot bird in snow oozing city people's sounds. Barbed wire snare, oh, tool. Prehensile howler, you have the wrong name. The choir was called Harmony. Born to Reaper, born to marry the Reaper's road boy. A silk purse made of pigs afraid to sleep, then sleep and are sown in the attitude of the living. Uh, that's true. The choir was really called Harmony. <laughs> Bizarre elementary school. Um, and this is my final poem of the evening. Uh, if you have a glass of wine or a spirit or a water, you might need it now. I wrote this in a very panicked time of my life, and it currently um, is the poem that closes my manuscript um, in progress. And uh, I think it's rather exciting, inspired a great deal by the work of Dorothy Lasky um, and a bit of Lucy Brock Broido, Sylvia Plath. I'll have little moments in here. So. I'll just go ahead and close it out. A painted door in the underworld. Poppet, look what they've done. The cake riles a mess of goblins. Lucifer is a sizzled curl of boy mane. And what about my one who rode a tricycle past the blonde gate of oblivion's swimming arms, drawn and quartered and floating out of mind here in the hilltop mansion. A broth of piss and doughy skirts. I've never believed in anyone, except for thieves and tramps and gentle Mitchell, St. Mitchell Blazier, who wrote this book, stitching me up with timelessness, thread by vile thread, in a hangman's girdle, by the light of tourniquet mice, pink bellies straddled against the lamp, hell bent on keeping the world at bay. You there, will you ever win, get everything you ever want? and lose it, and like the cat, you have a little ack-ack or whatever. Yes, you there, with a shrunken doll in lap. Come in, please, the door's forever sashed. My milking parlor of queer luck burns in blue cubicle holiness. You with the sad eyes, coughing bloody steaks down at the hog heaven diner with some druggy bow gravy. Here's your ticket, the throbbing slot mouth. Holy blue sevens, cock icing laurel, arches above us. Oh, Father, by yourself in the kitchen hiss. Burly prized animal, kiss me cruel. Divinely pinned in the mohair cardigan, howling out of a slit crate. Tuck into pleated sea meat, slowly as a god betrays. You're trapped and I call you by a dead child's treehouse password. At the god knock, you befriended him. Long before the raking fluids, he's marked you for the air. Baby, baby, I can't see out. The hot smoke and cram of larva will sound my forehead out of me if you don't hurry at your butchery. Knives come a-shining, my scrumptious taffy boa. Do not fail me now. This is tanked hampers of money and the glass eye of a barn boy. You've become the carnival prize. Behold, the tool spanking meadow, 
a bronze resin dog bounds, foamy jowls chasing bubbles blown by wet demons. The dozing shepherds promised us this, a flame and floating coats made up of something like baby hair and the deadbolt of a honky-tonk singer's rayon lip gloss. I've hired you here as our head chef. Hell, I hired you out of the rubble. It's time now to boil leather petals, bleach and ammonia on herringbone. The peppery smell of grimoire must be hidden exquisitely before the ax quarters and shines. My Lucy fur, peel back the scabby veil. By Avenue's end, let us drink from your grave. Carve what this cornered lamb in champagne weather lures out of his fleece. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mitchell. And thank all of you today. Amazing Kyle, Kelly, Tiffany, Rebecca, and Mitchell. Uh, quite a reading. Thanks so much. Um, I'm not going to hand the mic over to Cassandra to see what she has up her sleeve on the open mic. Oh, well, it's summer here, so I don't have sleeves, but I've got plenty of skin to hold things in. So John Wessick, he's always first. The Wombat Man is going to open for us uh, in our wonderful open this morning, if you're in Australia, or this evening where most of you are. Thank you. Duende, mouth open, teeth rotten, vocal chords bleeding it's not so much singing as screaming those gone complacent from parroting the powerful have silenced him for decades but he has the microphone now and by god he's going to use it that's uh, dedicated to shane mcgowan uh lead singer from the pogues who died last week thank you Oh, thank you so much. That was incredibly topical then. And I love the line, it's not so much singing as screaming. So uh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for opening, Boris. And we actually have John Riccio, who's next. And we welcome all Johns without H's. I think John Wessick was our um, was our motto <laughs> for um, the lip balm. So, John, are you around for a reading? Yes, you are. I see you there. What have you got for us? Awesome. Uh, I have a poem like so many of our poets tonight. It was so great to hear all these words and thank you for these opportunities and for Lit Balm. And this poem is called Everyday Diode. The language of a light bulb shares a kilowatt's syntax, practices sealing diction. You could drink out of one if Brighton shatter. Nothing lives in a photon except insect wings that permeate a Phillips scepter, translating a flicker as simple as renaming yourself halogen. Juice is cranberry or volt worth a flare in the hands of a highway majorette. Your neck, a desk lamp, a compliment for contortionist, the equivalent thirsty filament in my talk with Susan and Jaden, whose screens fluoresced, I claimed the bulbs taken after vertebrates, its makeover helical, not ovate. A sparkler burn and record player shock made me top 40 averse. Gigabytes are beautiful, but can't replicate unison the soons in the second movement of Sibelius II, their sound like spelunking with stuffed peppers for shoes. When a switch is depicted, it's a treatise on a fingertip. Welter is not warranty. I mourn better, well lit. Thank you. Loved it. Loved it so much. That was so clever. I love a kilowatt syntax. You got Sibelius. We got stuffed peppers. I think that was an amazing reading. Thank you so much. Uh, absolutely loved it. Next, we have the one and only DeWitt. He is post persimmon, so we don't know what he's got for us, but he is the master of wordplay. So uh, DeWitt, I'm excited to have you here and hear you read. Thank you. 
this is an obligatory news poem, and the news is that the Oxford Dictionary now includes a new word called riz. So this is riz on rise. Newly listed <coughs> as noun from charisma, the power to captivate, charm, compel, lead, sway, stir, and attract mass followings. Jeepers creepers, where'd you get those eyes? How they hypnotize. Personal magnetism, it, grace, magic, presence, genius, brand, whiz of a whiz in the sleight of hand biz. Pot-bellied roué, quarterback or material girl, swami or clown, media messiahs, though disdained by Orwellians, have become so common that abbreviation names their rise, claim, and fizz. And that's why we love him, people, because he has all the riz. Thank you, Dewitt. I'm so glad you made it uh, for our open. It's I've missed you. Thank you. Next, we have Maria. Maria, who's been very active and lovely in the comments section of this brilliant reading today. Maria, what have you got for us for the okay. open? Um, I was going to do a, a war piece, but I think we've probably had enough of that. So... I'm going to read something because John Lennon died, um, I forget how many, like more than 50 years ago yesterday. Okay. Yoko leaves the Dakota. To raise cows on a 600-acre farm, she and Beatles legend John Lennon purchased 50 years ago, outfitting it with a herd of 122 cows and 10 bulls, a dream to live on land as his father did with no plans of returning. Their attempt to create new lives away from crowds, smog, love-ins, and the ceaseless need to be them on West 72nd Street until 1980. Lennon was shot in the Dakota Archway on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception with no plans of returning. Out distancing his dad, 47-year-old Sean pushes wheelchair-bound Yoko from stage to stage, celebrity galas. She perches alone on the Marcellus Shale Plateau, protests fracking for the rest of us, no longer hibernates in the sprawling Dakota with no plans of returning. Controversial, she lived, starved through World War II, like a modern day Eve. Gossipy fans blamed her for breaking up Camelot, she offers them her Wish Tree series, started once she was widowed 50 years ago. At 90, it is as if she has lived 400 years with no plans of returning. Thank you. Wow, that was wonderful. Really stirring doco poetry. I really appreciate the kind of memorialization we've had um, today. It's been really exciting to, to think about some of these moments in history that shape us. Dominique, coming in from the same part of the world as me, uh, even though she has much better accent. Dominique, what have you got oh. for us today? <laughs> Hi, Cassandra. Um, I'm going to read a poem um, again from Endgame with no, no ending. It's called Telescopic. I wrote it during um, the confinement, and I thought I'd read it again because I copped COVID again. So, telescopic, a knock on the door. How could you, how, I'll start again. A knock on the door, how could that be at a time of confinement? Normally you would peek through the curtains, but now that old glass has been replaced by tightly fitting stainless steel windows, you are caught at your own game. Professor, knock, knock. A glance at the computer screen. You should be worried, you know. 
For decades, you've been knocking on the door of civil and military space agencies trying to get access to sounding rockets and satellites because in your eyes, space has theoretical as well as technical advantages, such as the absence of gravity and low level of thermal perturbations. Feel how cold the house is, how it begins to rock and look, your telescope's marching across the room now, its big eye fastened on you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry you have COVID again, but that was a fabulous reading. I love the knock at the door and the way that you use the trope um, in that incredible poem. So thank you so much, Dominique. We wish you get well soon. Um, now thank we have you. our wonderful duo who always end the open. We've got badass Cindy. Cindy, what do you got? I've got an old poem. Um, I've been because I'm not writing a lot, I've been digging up some of my old stuff to read. This is from my very first chapter called Wednesday's Child. Um, I probably wrote it in my 20s. Um, it's called Cupid Plays with Matches. You are shooting hot and cold arrows in the same place where someone left their kisses before he went to sleep forever. Me, I'm a vagabond, a stillborn baby, a doorstep orphan, a femme fatale, an addict of paradox, a whorehouse of lies. You, you're a hypnotist on a tightrope, a gavel of danger. I am in a trance on a trampoline. You are the silent bowels. I am the bold block, all the news that's fit to print letters. They jump off the page and into your lap. Or maybe you're just the misplaced comma of my unfinished sentence. And I have to say that was before I became a copy editor. So I don't know where all those comments came from. <laughs> I loved it. How feisty Cindy in her 20s. That doesn't surprise me at all. Isn't it Wednesday's Child is full of woe, right? Wednesday's Child was feisty. Yeah, I'm, that... I'm going to read more of those. Old They're ones. great. Love them. Yeah. You need to follow up now. You need part two for the next book. Okay, our last our last reader. We always put him last because you know I love to take a little bit of Bob away with me at the end of the open for the rest of my day and think about some enigmatic comment or slightly bizarre or surreal or who knows, Bob can sing. He might tap dance for us one day from his kitchen. Bob, what is the morsel that you have for me today to end the open? Okay, it's an information piece. The music was the wrong size to fit inside of the plot. Even if its head was shaved and its spurs removed, it still would not fit. They had to cajole it so it would stay at all. But it was the only mirror they could find to use. It grew angry if its tail was touched or if it was imitated by the poultry. It grew angry too if it was given a name too soon. No one could be found who could understand its branches or the things that grew there. There was no one who could measure it without allowing its fluids to escape. Oh, you did it again, Bob. That was brilliant. Absolutely loved it. Straight from the kitchen into our hearts. Thank, Thank you, you, Bob. And back to back to Mark and Jeff, I think. I'm, it's my birthday next week, so you can all um, think of me next week. Um, Happy birthday to you. <laughs> child. But today's Saturday. is Saturday night, wherever you are. That was so amazing. Oh, what a reading. Oh, wow. well, well, thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, Kyle, oh, Kelly, you Tiffany, you. Rebecca, and Mitchell for that, for that amazing reading. And thank you, Open Micahs. Yeah, uh, we all have to go to Tupelo now. 
Tupelo and, and Blaze Vaults. Yeah. Here's, here's, here's the last poem to just like close things out and kind of like a, an open, open break in the sky. It's called More Misdeeds. Once again, thinking the unthinkable. All those optimisms deserve a punishment. The supreme being flying or swimming, elusive, multifaceted, free, hypothetical, pulverized, with an ounce of meaning, therefore a problem for the gods. Quite on the horns of the dilemma, snagged on the peaks, in a word. We'll see what happens next. Thank you everyone so much for, for tonight. Uh, it was an amazing reading. Hope to see you next week when we have the Chive Collective from Boston, uh, including Annie Pluto and many other friends. So please drop by for them. And well, lots of love and poetry and have an amazing night. Good night. Thank you, terrific reading.